Welcome to the Why on Earth Communities Stewardship and Sustainability Podcast Series. Today, we have visiting with us Hunter Lovins. Hi, Hunter. Howdy. Great to see you. So good to be with you. Hunter is president of Natural Capitalism Solutions. She is the author of 16 books, including Climate Capitalism, Natural Capitalism, and her most recent book, A Finer Future. She has hundreds of professional papers published in business and academic journals, and is teacher of sustainable business management at Bard College in New York. Hunter is also CEO of Change Finance, which has released the first truly fossil fuel free exchange traded fund, which you can find with the ticker CHGX. Hunter, it's so great to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. And thanks so much for having me. Well, I am just so excited to share with our audience that you just recently published this new book, A Finer Future. And it does such a masterful job of presenting the real pickle that we're in, but the fact that we have incredible solutions right at our fingertips. And it leaves us in a very hopeful place. And I'm just curious if uh, you could share what was the impetus behind this? What caused you to want to land on such a hopeful note? A lot of people are saying there is no hope. It's over. Mm. And don't do this because it'll put you in a very bad mood. But you can Google near-term human extinction and mm. find what purports to be science saying that humans go extinct within 10 years. I think that's the most profoundly irresponsible position that you can take. We know how to solve all the problems facing us. We have the technologies. We simply have to implement it. And I was in an argument with some people who were essentially saying, it's over. I said, it's not. And they said, prove it. So four of us got together. My colleague Stuart Wallace, who for many years ran New Economics Foundation in the UK. Anders Wiegmann, who is very active in climate policy in the Swedish government. John Fullerton, founder of Capital Institute for 18 years at J.P. Morgan, left as managing director. And we pulled together the best of the science, of the policy, of what people are really doing on the ground around the world to solve the scary problems like climate change mm -hmm. and profit thereby. Mm -hmm. For example, we can solve half the climate crisis if a colleague of mine, Tony Seba, is correct. Tony says, inevitably, by 2030, the world will be 100% renewably powered mm -hmm. because of four things. Fall in the cost of solar, fall in the cost of storage batteries, the electric car and the driverless car. Uh, Shenzhen, China, today just announced that their bus fleet is now 100% electric. Mm. You may have seen that uh, General Motors recently closed six manufacturing facilities or announced that it will because they're getting ready for the electric car, the autonomous car. California has already met its, goal, its 2020 goal of renewable power, so they said, why don't we go 100%? Hmm. So they did. Here in, here in Colorado, we've just elected a governor pledging to go 100%. Yeah. Recently, the utility, our coal-loving utility, put out a, a bid. Who can give us 1,100 megawatts of power, any source, any price? The lowest fossil bid, four cents a kilowatt hour. Hmm. Wind a bit below two, solar a bit above two. Wind plus storage plus, wind plus solar plus storage, mm -hmm. three cents. Amazing. Cheaper than natural gas, which heretofore had been the cheapest. And not just marginally cheaper, cheaper by a significant... Considerable. Amount. And these were median bids, so there were bids that were even cheaper than that. Mm. Everywhere in the world today, the renewables are cheaper than fossil energy. Now, if Tony is right, we will solve half the climate crisis at a profit, but we will also see the dissolution in value of oil, gas, coal, uranium, nuclear, the utility industry, the auto industry, the banks that hold paper in them, pension funds and insurance companies that are invested in them. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the mother of all disruptions. Mm -hmm. So we, we solve half the climate crisis and crash the global economy all at once. Okay. We are in very interesting times. Mm -hmm. What this says is we're going to reinvent everything. Mm -hmm. How we do business is going to change. 
which is to say, Yahoo for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Startup companies, young people have the opportunity of their lifetime. Most people grow up in a time in history when things are going to be pretty much the way they always have been. Right. That's not true now. Right. So just enormous opportunity. Now we solve the other half of the climate crisis through regenerative agriculture. Folk like Gabe Brown. Gabe was a uh, corn soybean commodity farmer in the Dakotas who was going broke. He said, I'm going broke. I'm going to do something different. First he went to no-till, stop inverting the soil. Yeah. Then he planted cover crops, deep-rooted plants that took nutrients deep into the ground. Mm -hmm. Then he brought on animal impact. Cows, sheep, goats, pigs, they ate the cover crops, so he no longer has to grow feed for them. Their hooves chop up the soil, they fertilize it, and he has them on it only enough to disturb the soil, then he moves them to another pasture and another pasture. Very like bison used to move across the Great Plains, mm -hmm. dense packed because of predators, now we do it with electric fences. Mm -hmm. And it was that co-evolution of animals and grasslands that gave us the 10 feet of thick black soil the pioneers found when they came, first came across the Great Plains. Mm -hmm. Gabe has gone in some of his pastures from a little over 1% soil organic matter to in some over 11%. Remarkable. He's taking carbon out of the air, putting it back in the soil where it's a nutrient, and he's now wildly profitable. Yes. So just with those two examples, renewable energy, regenerative agriculture, we know how to solve the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the book, we profile how to transform finance, the corporate sector, energy, agriculture, and the policy measures that can address such issues as the crushing inequality that we now have. Yeah. We're now more unequal than we were before the Great Depression. And as Tom O'Picketty showed in his book, Capital in the 21st Century, these levels of inequality drive to economic collapse. Right. So we have a choice. We, we, can, we can crash the global economy, mm. or we can build the greatest prosperity humankind has ever known. Mm. And that's what we were trying to do in the book, is set out how we can do this, what the role of entrepreneurs are, little startup companies. I mentor for a group called Unreasonable. Mm -hmm. With a name like that, I'd have to be a part of it. <laughs> and we bring young entrepreneurs from around the world. I was just over in the UK working with some young people from Africa. Mm. And from the UK, from all across Europe. Uh, in June, I was in Hong Kong with young entrepreneurs from around Asia from India. Everywhere you go in the world, people are hungry for this opportunity to personally make a difference, to make a good living, and by doing that, to solve the gnarly problems. Yeah, it's so exciting and so hopeful. I, you know, one of the things that strikes me with some of my friends and colleagues around the United States is that it seems there's a, a dearth of good news in this culture in particular. And I think, you know, a part of the reason we want to have these kinds of discussions is to share with folks that there is so much underway already uh, that is cause for great hope. And I'm, I'm struck that in the chapter on corporate transformation, there's a sense that this is well underway. And maybe you could speak to that a little bit. I was on the phone yesterday with a, with a major international company, household brand name, <clears throat> and they said, help us transform. Mm. We know that we're a company of the last century. We want to be a company that is committed to efficiency in our workplace, so good quality, good quality work for our workers, yeah. and enhancing the quality of our communities. Yeah. That's a pretty good vision. So I walked through tools we have, mm -hmm. things like the helix of managing a sustainable organization, mm -hmm. where we lay out what are the activities that a company can do as it just starts into the journey, as it spreads energy efficiency, resource productivity throughout its operations, as it commits to redesign how it makes and delivers products and services. 
using approaches like the circular economy or biomimicry. Mm -hmm. And then how it commits to being a regenerative company, yeah. regenerating human and natural capital, both for itself and for its community. They were so excited to know that there are pragmatic things that a company can do that will cut its cost, enhance its profitability, and engage its workforce. Mm. I cited to them the numbers from Gallup Healthways that an engaged workforce is 18% more productive, 16% mm -hmm. more profitable mm -hmm. than a similar workforce in an identical industry where the workforce is unengaged. We know from groups like uh, Economist Intelligence Unit, a notably conservative outfit, that one of the best ways to engage your workforce is to enable them to be implementing more sustainable practices as part of their day job. Yes. You know, a lot of companies will have, well, oh, we're going to celebrate Earth Day. We're going to plant a tree. Mm -hmm. How sweet. Mm -hmm. If instead you say to the workers, look around you. Look at the ways in which we use resources, the waste that we create, any toxics that we may have, and let's work together to eliminate the toxics, to eliminate the waste. Waste is unsaleable production. You pay to make it, you're not deriving any value from it. You eliminate it, you cut your costs. Yeah. So you start with those easy savings. The sa those savings then pay to get progressively more ambitious about, for example, committing to go 100% renewably powered. There are now hundreds of companies that have pledged and are delivering on becoming 100% renewable. I work, for example, with Unilever. They've mm -hmm. committed to this. Mm -hmm. And when you make that kind of a commitment, and then you say, as, as is true of many companies, we don't know how to do this, but let's work together to figure it out. Now you're asking your people to become a part of the solution. And they realize when they go to work, they're working on what they want for their families, for their community. They're building a finer future. What so, an exciting place so to be beautiful. working. And what a great way to attract and retain talent, right? It's just an incredible win-win. You've heard the phrase, the triple bottom line. Mm -hmm. This was uh, coined by uh, great sustainability uh, worker John Alkington. Maybe he, for our audience, we might just mention that this is referring to businesses that are, in addition to financial performance, looking at impacts on social and natural capital. And we talk a so lot people, about capital. Yeah. Planet and profit. Yeah. Makes the triple bottom line. Well, John has just done a product recall on that phrase mm. because he realized it doesn't work terribly well. What we've come up with is this concept called the integrated bottom line. Yeah. Which is to say, if, if you ask a business to have three books, three sets of accounting, if times are tough, what are they going to shed? Right. Yeah, people and planet. Right. But if I can show them that the route to profitability is to behave responsibly to people and planet, now it's baked in. It's core to their profitability. And we've counted 13 ways in which behaving more responsibly is just better business. So for example, you cut your costs. You also cut your risks. If you're not using toxic material, your workers are not going to get as sick. They're not going to sue you. Your liabilities go down. Now you are a more appealing investment target. The whole impact investment community is going to look at you and say, well, responsible company, I want to be part of that. You attract and retain the best talent. Mm -hmm. And that's worth an enormous amount. A uh, man named Bob Willard has figured that could be as much as 10% add to your profitability, not having to replace, retrain workers. You better brand yourself. Mm -hmm. You better manage your supply chain. Why did Walmart announce its green initiatives? Trust me, it was not out of goodness of their heart. Mm -hmm. when, uh, when Walmart goes green, you know there's a business case. Mm -hmm. In their case, they wanted to better manage their supply chain. They have at least 100,000 suppliers. They have no idea how many they actually have. By publishing the Walmart sustainability scorecard, they were better able to say, these are suppliers from whom we want to buy, 
these are the ones that we'll just let go by the way. Question number one on that scorecard, do you measure your carbon footprint? Question number two, do you report to the Carbon Disclosure Project? Mm. The who? <laughs> CDP is a group of kids who about 15 years ago, just cause, said, set out to the Financial Times 500, 500 biggest companies on earth, a little survey saying, what's your carbon footprint? Now, for a few years, everybody ignored them. I mean, mm -hmm. who died and made them God? Mm. But they're backed by institutional investors who want to know what a company's carbon footprint is. And so now, essentially, every major company on earth reports to CDP. And CDP has shown that the companies that are leading in measuring and managing their carbon footprint have 18% higher return on investment than the laggards, 67% higher than companies that say, carbon, we don't care. Mm -hmm. This is better business. Mm -hmm. Notice I'm not talking about saving the polar bears. Right. Although it will help do that as well. Right. This is simply better business. And so we are seeing around the world the smartest companies are becoming the most responsible companies. What an incredible transformation. My goodness. I'd like to switch gears just a little bit and uh, ask you, you know, I, I know you have a law degree and I happen to know a handful of lawyers and friends with a few and uh, boy, the path that you have gone down in your career is not the typical path of a lawyer. And I'm just curious, how did that happen from, from law school, Loyola, all the way through to what you're doing now, inspiring and impacting folks all over the world? What, what was that that got you on that path? Well, I'm not sure I had a whole lot of choice. Um, my mother worked in the coal fields with John L. Lewis organizing mine workers. My father helped mentor Cesar Chavez and Martin King. Mm. They were around the house when I was growing up. So trying to craft a finer future is sort of the family business. Mm -hmm. I took a law degree because I believed that would be the best way to drive change. Now, blessings on the good environmental lawyers, good social justice lawyers, but I decided that's not the most effective way mm -hmm. to drive change. So I quit, mm -hmm. became a forester, started doing environmental education, helped uh, build a little group in California called Tree People, which, which is still there, mm -hmm. still planting trees and doing environmental education. Tracked from that into energy policy. Uh, helped create a little group called Rocky Mountain Institute, ran that for 20 years till they fired me, created uh, natural capitalism, and here we are. Along the way, helped create a couple of uh, business schools in sustainable management, now teach at the Bard MBA, in which this stuff is baked into every class. Yeah. Most, you know, if you go to Harvard, you will spend your business school career reading cases, mm -hmm. generally written by academics who were not there when it happened. Even if it's a case about something with sustainability, the academic typically changes the facts because they want to make some point. Mm -hmm. And I've asked them, I said, I was there. That's not how it happened. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you tell the truth? Oh, well, I wanted to make this point. Mm -hmm. At Bard, all of our faculty are practitioners. This is what we do as our day yeah, job. Right. And then we teach. It's what's called a hybrid program. So we come together four days a month and are face to face. It's like a, an intensive retreat. Then for the rest of the month, classes are online. And then a month later, we come back together. It's mm -hmm. a full on two year MBA. Yep. I think it's a better way to learn. Seems and our much. students are now taking jobs as heads of sustainability, yeah. working with the leading sustainability research groups, going into big corporations, helping to run the badass uh, change agent NGOs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Incredible. It seems like it's a much more hands-on and impactful approach to that education. Eh? When they arrive, first day of their business school career, they enter a class called NYC Lab. We use the city of New York as a living laboratory, mm. and they become a consultant, taught by Laura Gitman of Businesses for Social Responsibility, one of the best sustainability consulting groups. They learn how to be a consultant. And most schools will say, oh, uh, go play in traffic, kid. Go get an internship. We actually teach people how to do this work. 
I teach principles of sustainable management, then a course on political economy, globalization, the sort of international issues, how you do this stuff in developing countries, and what's going on with big trade flows, and why things like the, uh, the ideology of neoliberalism is impoverishing all of us, mm. and why things like uh, John Fullerton's regenerative economics is a much better approach. And I was just on the phone this morning with a group called the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, which Fullerton and I helped to create along with Stuart Wallace. This is a, an international group that now has about 70 members of the leading new economy groups from around the world, all of us working to build a new narrative of an economy in service to life. Mm. And as Buckminster Fuller called for, an economy that works for 100% of humanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's Beautiful. fun stuff. Beautiful. One of the things I really appreciate <clears throat> about the uh, the book, A Finer Future, and, and the approach it takes to discussing all of this, is it, it takes just a, a bit of time and space to talk about how we got to where we are in terms of what was set forth toward the end of World War II. And, you know, it's my sense, working with various business leaders, various folks in policy and other parts of our society, that many of us almost take for granted, as if they were natural laws, the rules of the so-called economic game that we're all playing by. And it seems to me as more and more of us realize, my goodness, these aren't natural laws, these are very much human constructs. We begin to understand probably more some of the challenges and some of the opportunities. So I'm wondering, could you just give us a quick overview what happened at the end of World War II? Sure. <clears throat> my friend Bernard Lantar says, uh, humans are an interesting species. We create stories and imbue them with our own reality, and we, then we forget that we made the story. <laughs> and we think, oh, well, this, this, is, this is a natural law. It's not. Mm -hmm. Economics is it, an art, a craft. It's not a science. Yeah. We're in the mess we're in because in 1947, 36 men gathered at a hotel outside Montreux, Switzerland, a place called Mont Pelerin. And yeah, they were all men. Now, 1947, Europe's in ruins. Ludwig von Mises is appalled at what National Socialism has done to trash Europe. Mm -hmm. Frederick Hayek is scared to death of the rise in the East of Soviet collectivism. Mm -hmm. And Milton Friedman believes that the individual is the only legitimate economic actor. Mm -hmm. They and 33 of their buddies argued for 10 days and built the intellectual foundations, which they call neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. And their story is very simple. Humans are greedy bastards, but that's okay because the market is perfect. And in a perfect market, you against me will somehow aggregate to the greater good. No, it won't. It hasn't. It's not how it works. We are on the edge of system-wide collapse. David Attenborough at the uh, climate conference in Poland released a statement saying, we are looking at the end of civilization. And this is what neoliberalism has wrought. This belief that money is the only thing that matters. And if you're rich, it's a sign that you're blessed by God. It's the old Calvinism. Mm -hmm. It's not true. Mm -hmm. But they were very effective at putting this ideology together. They also lucked into a brilliant storyteller, a woman named Ayn Rand, who mm -hmm. wrote Atlas Shrugged, mm -hmm. which remains of, to the extent that uh, our Cheeto in Chief reads, this is, he says, one of his books. Paul Ryan, it's one of his favorite books. Mm -hmm. um, Alan Greenspan credits that book with his mental model. Mm -hmm. Until 2008, when he said, the market isn't working like it's supposed to. Right. And he said, I, I am gobsmacked. Yeah. These guys truly believe this, this narrative. Mm -hmm. The trouble is it's bad science. The evolutionary biologists now tell us humans are not inherently greedy bastards. Mm -hmm. When the first pre-humans came out of the trees in Africa, we were naked, our claws aren't worth much, our teeth are pretty inadequate, we're not as fast as a lion. And there were many tribes of these pre-humans, most of them went extinct. 
Our ancestors were down to fewer in number than the now endangered gorillas. But they survived, and you and I are here today, because they cared more for the good of the whole than any one of them cared for him or herself. Mm -hmm. We know this from the DNA, from the archaeology. They cared for elderly. Mm -hmm. They cared for disabled. Mm -hmm. If you're in a survival of the meanest bastard, you don't take elderly and crippled people along with you. Right. You shed them. Altruism, say these evolutionary biologists, is not a flaw. It's who we are. And it's why we love Facebook. It's why we love people. It's why we people watch. We love each other. And we care about each other. And this is the beginnings of a new discipline called humanistic management. My colleague, Dr. Michael Pearson, professor at Fordham, has built the International Humanistic Management Network of business teachers around the world who are teaching a new way of doing business based on how do we enhance the well-being of us all? How do we care? How do we work together? Mm. This approach, we think, is the basis of this new narrative, regenerative economics that John Fullerton has laid out, humanistic management, the, the best of these evolutionary sciences, the understanding that what people want, and we know this because if you ask them, it's what they tell you, yeah. the world around, what people want is to be happy. Yeah. And they want a sense of belonging. And they want a sense that they are contributing to something more than themselves, something bigger. So we think this is the basis of a new narrative, of a new economics. And this is bubbling up everywhere, whether it be Kate Rayworth's brilliant book, Donut Economics, mm -hmm. How Do You Live Below the Planetary Boundaries But Above the Human Minimums, this sweet spot that she calls the donut. Groups of young economics students, a group called Rethinking Economics, there are literally hundreds of these groups now around the world all beginning to coalesce around this new narrative. My colleague, uh, Dr. Catherine Trebek, is working with governments. She was just in Korea at a meeting on well-being put on by the Organization of Economic Development and Cooperation, OECD, mm -hmm. Economic Cooperation and Development, mm -hmm. on well-being. <laughs> OECD now has a metric of well-being. And you can go on their Better Life website and see how your country compares to other countries in different aspects of well-being. Beautiful. The we governments are looking at can we shift from keeping nat national systems of account from GDP, gross domestic product, which is just a, a measure of the flow through the economy of money and stuff, mm -hmm. to metrics of well-being. Yeah. And when governments start to do this, then they make very different policy decisions. They begin to care more about what's happening at the community level. Yeah. Are people healthy? Are they happy? Are they well educated? We know that we live on a little planet. We cannot continue to grow the throughput of money and stuff. But we can keep growing well-being. Mm -hmm. How happy you are, how well educated you are, Music, culture, arts. Uh, whoa, but come on, we've got to be serious. We need an economy. <laughs> we've started doing some figuring here in Colorado. <laughs> but what is our economy? Yeah. We're building this regenerative hub in what we call the Upper South Platte watershed, mm -hmm. which is basically the Denver, Boulder, Fort Collins area. Mm -hmm. People say, oh, we're an extractive industries economy. You gotta have oil, gas, mining, timber, conventional agriculture. Actually, those are dying industries. Mm -hmm. The natural foods industry provides four times as many jobs as all of those combined. Outdoor industries, right. growing industry. Culture, art, is a vibrant part of the Colorado economy. Education, clean technology, startup entrepreneuring. 
These are the real economy of Colorado, and they're regenerative. Mm -hmm. They are what's making us better off. Mm -hmm. They're not polluting. They're not damaging to the ecosystem. They're not harmful to the people who are working in those professions. They, they make us enjoy a higher quality of life. Yes. So this is what we ought to be growing, yeah. and we ought to then be pruning away the legacy industries that are that are part of the problem. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love about this <clears throat> message and the way that you're presenting it is that as we make this transition over the coming years, we are talking about an opportunity for so many of us from all walks and backgrounds and places all over to have improved quality of life. And I, I'm curious, I wonder if more and more of us understood that we might even more quickly get on board and a part participate in this transition that's already underway. As I said, uh, we're, we're looking at a time of incredible economic dislocation. Mm in which the old industries are crumbling in front of us. And it's important that we ask ourselves, how do we ensure quality livelihoods for everyone? How do we transition in a way that brings justice, equity, to the people who gave us the, the world that we have today? So that we enable people to retrain, to get good jobs in these new industries, or if, as some people say, Artificial intelligence will end most jobs. Hmm. We're all going to be out of work. Hmm. Well, then we need new systems to ensure that we still have a high quality of life. Hmm. So my colleague, Dr. Randall Ray, teaches uh, at Bard, has a proposal called Guaranteed Jobs, which hmm. I guess now the Democrats are starting to pick up. Hmm. And he says yeah, the government ought to pay any nonprofit, and I believe local government, who can hire people to do the jobs that are needed at $15 an hour at least, full benefits, health care, retirement, child care. Now the corporates will have to pay the same amount if they want to attract good talent. Mm -hmm. You've just done away with poverty. Mm -hmm. You've, uh, you're well on your way to reversing inequality. And you're putting money in the pockets of people, mm -hmm. and it is that spending of the money that then generates economic health within the society. This thing will pay for itself, and it will provide a very high quality of life for us all. So check Absolutely. it out. Guaranteed Jobs. Absolutely. Randall beautiful. Ray. Let me mention that uh, to our audience, this is the Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series brought to you by the Why on Earth community, and today we are visiting with Hunter Lovins, author of A Finer Future. And uh, for folks who are interested in connecting with you, Hunter, via Twitter, your handle is at hlovins, and folks can also uh, get themselves copies of the book at ourfinerfuture.com. Or your favorite local bookstore, support independent bookstores. Beautiful, support your local bookstore, and for folks who are interested in uh, learning more about the work you're doing generally around the world, they can go to natcapsolutions.org. We'll have all the spellings in our show notes. And I just want to mention as well that for our audience as a thank you for tuning in, uh, if you'd like to check out any of the Why on Earth audiobooks or ebooks, you can go to whyonearth.org and use the code podcast for a little discount on those. Uh, so we encourage you to check all this out, and I really encourage you to check out uh, A Finer Future. It's a, it's a wonderful book, packed with information presented in such a way that it will quickly give you uh, an education on where we're at and where we're heading, and how you can uh, plug in and get involved with that. One of the things that really jumped out at me, Hunter, in reading A, F a Finer Future is this parable of the caterpillar. And I, I think it's so important for folks to hear this. And I'm, I'm wondering if you might uh, summarize, what is this parable of the caterpillar? How does this relate for us? Have you ever seen a caterpillar? Yes. Crawling along the ground, mm -hmm. munching away on a leaf, like a happy little critter, until one day something drives it to attach to a branch yeah. and begin 
an incredible transformation. Mm. Now, our happy little caterpillar crawling around the ground has no earthly idea what's fixing to happen to it. Mm. You ever broken one of these chrysalises apart? There's no worm in there, there's no butterfly in there, there's just goo. Mm. And if our world feels gooey right now, maybe it's because we're in the midst of this profound transformation. But with the caterpillar, if you're patient, it starts to change and something wholly different starts to emerge. It's weak at first. I've talked to people who, seeing the butterfly struggling to break out of the chrysalis, help it, they break the chrysalis away. And what results is this weak, crippled little creature. It has to fight. Part of what gives the, the butterfly the ability to fly is the fight is the struggle, mm. is breaking the chrysalis apart and then spreading its wings and letting the sun and the wind dry it. So I ask people, given that we know how to solve all of the problems facing us, do you want to be a part of it? <laughs> Absolutely. Then let's fly. Love it. Hunter, thank you so much for joining us today. It's such a pleasure talking to you. Aaron, my pleasure.